we're looking at the solution for, um, or we will be in a minute, the extreme temperatures on a metal plate with the temperature function t of x comma y is equal to x squared plus 2x plus y squared in the shape of x squared plus 4, y squared is less than or equal to 24. So a couple of things that we need. We, we have our distraction number one. Um, we have our function, our variable function, uh, multivariable. And we can, from there, determine our partials, t sub x, t sub y. So 2x plus 2 and y squared. Those are easy enough. Um, pfft, would be if I didn't do it wrong. All right, so 2y. Um, we also need a boundary function. So that's what I, I put in my Desmos calculator here. You can see that the boundary is a shaded uh, ellipse. All right, or at least a, in the shape of a shaded ellipse, but the boundary itself is really the border of that ellipse, which takes on the form of x squared plus 4y squared equals 24. All right, so if I want to create a multivariable function out of this, I want to set it equal to 0, so x squared plus 4y squared minus 24 equals 0. And it's kind of like uh, solving a quadratic just in the reverse order, all right? So normally you'd, you'd start off with like y equals whatever, then you swap out a y for zero and then solve from there, all right? That's essentially what happened here is that we have g of x comma y taking on the role of zero. We're just kind of working backwards, all right? The reason we're doing that is because this, this boundary needs to be projected down onto the xy plane, right? g of xy, regardless of how differing the notation looks from the t of xy, it still represents a z, right? So it's allowing for a variable z, whereas the boundary itself is uh, projected down onto the xy plane, this is allowing us to shoot upwards or downwards from that x, x y plane. All right, and you can't see the hand gesture that I made, but the, I was gesturing shooting upwards or downwards from the x y plane. All right, because you have a solid that um, that that exists beyond the x y plane. So if you look down at, you know, we, we have this original diagram here, but if you look down at this one, what you're looking at is what would happen if your boundary function would shoot upwards and intersect with that xy plane. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it starts off the xy plane, intersect with the, uh, the surface, all right? So it's allowing us to kind of um, create a, a cylindrical effect, you know, shoot upwards from the xy plane and intersect with that surface in order to create the true boundary that would exist, all right? So that if we could extend it infinitely, it would get all of these little distances in here, and it would restrict the um, the surface, eliminating. And you know, I can just use a um, a white marker here. I'll show you. It would, if we restrict all this stuff out of there, it would be like it never happened. All right. So it's kind of a, a truncated surface. It's, it's sort of like a restricted domain when you're, it's exactly like a restricted domain when you're dealing with something in a two-dimensional coordinate system, right? So it's, um, it's pretty analogous when it comes to that. Just uh, if I erase too much of it, you start losing a lot of the, uh, the meat and potatoes here. All right, but hopefully you're getting the idea. Yeah, if I, if I start erasing this part of it, it's going to be like there's nothing there. Well, I guess I can get rid of some of it, you know, just so you get a little bit of a visual. Yeah, something along those lines. All right. So that's what the effect is of that, uh, that boundary function. All right. So long story short, I need partials related to that. So I need a G, poor quality G, G sub X, which, which would be equal to 2X. I need a g sub y, which would be equal to 8y. 
All right. Lagrange multipliers allows for a proportional relationship between the multivariable function and its boundary function. So that proportionality constant, I can't even speak, proportionality constant would be some arbitrary variable known as lambda or uh, constant known as lambda. So I would say Tx is equal to lambda times g, g sub x. T sub y is equal to lambda times g sub y. All right, so T sub x specifically in this case is 2x plus 2. G sub x is equal to 2x. T sub y, 2y. G sub y, 8y. All right. So the, the simpler one looks to be um, <clears throat> the y component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off the 2y from both sides. We're looking at lambda times 8y minus 2y is equal to 0. I get a GCF that I could pull out. 2y is going to give me 4 lambda, just double checking that, minus 1 would be equal to 0. Set each of those equal to 0 up. Oh, you know, just double checking. Okay. Um, set each of those equal to zero and you get y equals zero so i get a solution for y which is good news and i got uh, a lambda equal to one fourth all right i can do something similar on the other end i can try to solve for x in terms of lambda or lambda in terms of x if i try to do that it just makes things a little messier but since i now know what lambda is lambda is a quarter i can swap that in you get 2x plus 2 is equal to a quarter times 2x. Simplify 2x plus 2 is equal to, really it's just a, a half x. If I'm solving, I'll bring the 2x over, I'll subtract, or I'll go the other way, I guess, to subtract the 2x from both sides. You get 2 equals negative 3 over 2 of x. Cross multiply, you get x equals negative 4 thirds. A little keep change flip. Multiply by the reciprocal. So I have a value of x, but that value of x seems to be independent from the value of y. All right. Fortunately, we have a relation that equates x and y. All right. So if I go back up here, see this well actually i was going to just highlight one of them but i can highlight both of them both of these expressions equate the values of x and y so we do have a relationship between the two of them so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to snag x squared plus 4y squared equals 24. i'm going to pop in the negative four thirds for an x squared. All right, so when I put that in, I get 16 thirds, or 16 thirds, 16 ninths. 4y squared is equal to 24. Do a quick subtraction here. Minus 16 ninths is 22 over two. Make that a fraction, 200 ninths. Divide that by 4. Well, that's easy enough. So uh, I'm going to rewrite. 4y squared is equal to 200 ninths. Divide that by 4. Multiply by 1 fourth. You get 50 ninths. Which makes y equal to plus or minus the square root of 50 over 3. All right. But I can also separately... So x squared plus y squared equals 24. Swap out, uh, I haven't used this color yet. Swap out the y for a zero and solve for the corresponding value of x. All right, so x squared equals 24. So x would be equal to plus or minus root 24. 
All right, running out of space here because I wrote like jumbo size. So let me uh, bring that down a little bit. Ooh, we got a little wonky there. Actually, I can bring this down a little bit too. So what that gives me is a set of ordered pairs. So the, the y value of zero corresponded with the x values of uh, radical 24 and negative radical 24. You can simplify the radicals if you want. I, I don't need you to though. All right, so let me get, um, I'm gonna go back to black here. So possible extrema We're looking at, I'll, I'll write them individually, negative radical 24 comma zero comma T of, you know, whatever the, the, the Z value is in my temperature function of negative radical 24 comma zero. Same idea just with uh, a positive 24 or positive radical 24, I should say. All right, I can kind of bring that in a little bit. Then the X value of negative four thirds corresponded with each of those Y values. So negative four thirds comma negative root 50 over three. comma t, poor quality t, as in, I forgot to write the t, negative four thirds, comma, negative root 50 over three. Close them up. And then the last possible uh, extreme value would be the same thing that I just wrote, just um, the positive radical 50 over three. And doop. All right, so I got to crunch all these numbers, which is going to be extraordinarily fun. Uh, well, it's not going to be that bad because we're going to pop all these in for T. And T is given to be X squared plus 2X plus Y squared. So what I'll do instead is type in A squared because I don't want um, Desmos to get confused with the multivariable nature of this. Um, so x, uh, a squared plus 2a plus y squared, uh, b squared, double check, yeah. And then I'll just crunch these numbers, all right? So I like to get my um, final expression on the bottom there. So it's not going to be easy. It's not even going to be possible to scroll around and find negative radical 24. So I'll just type that in. B being equal to zero, because that's taking on the role of Y, that's easy enough. Uh, easier said than done. May have to type it in. In the end, it's not a big deal. So we're getting, oh, that's an eraser. negative root 24 comma zero comma about 14.2 as an ordered triple all right just making sure it's all in the way i want it the next one is going to be a positive root 24 still with a zero That gives me about 33.8. All right, what are we looking for again here? We're looking for extreme temperatures, so the highest or the lowest. All right, so negative four thirds for my A value. The B value, negative root 50 over three corresponds to about four, well, that one I can get a fraction, 14 thirds. 
So negative 4 thirds, negative root 50 over 3, and 14 thirds. You put the decimal if you want. I mean, we already did it for the other ones. And then popping in a positive for radical 50 over 3, also 14 over 3. So I'll do a copy-paste job there. So it looks like we have our answer. All right, so again, this is just a positive. So the highest value would be the, abs um, be the absolute maximum. And we're looking for extreme temperatures. All right, so this is the max. Thirty-three point eight degrees. Min temperature. I'm fine with fourteen over three. Fourteen thirds of a degree, but if you want, you put it in decimal form. About four point seven degrees. You know, um, they didn't give us any context here aside from the fact that it's temperature. They didn't say whether it was degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, whatever. I'm kind of. Um, inclined to think that it's more likely Celsius than Fahrenheit because temperatures on a metal plate, I equated this to temperatures on a stove, you know, a stove top. If this were Fahrenheit, we'd be looking at a little bit over uh, the freezing mark, you know, so that's, that's not something that I would consider to be very likely. So 33.8, uh, yeah, uh, degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, that, that's about 92.84 degrees, all right? So it's uh, warm, you know, it's not gonna cook anything, but it's, it's pretty warm, all right? And then if I do, um, what was it, 4.7 degrees? About 40.46 degrees. All right, it's still on the cold side, but, uh, but it's more likely that it's Celsius than it would be Fahrenheit, but we, we don't know that for sure. So we just leave it as degrees. And um, the one thing we don't know is that, or we, we do know, I should say, is that it's not referencing angles, you know. Um, just out of curiosity, it's definitely not Kelvin, all right, because uh, the 4.7, the 4.7 would be the troublemaker there, you know, because 33.8, well, even that, even that would be pretty, pretty low, but, um, you know, the, the 4.7 would be pretty close to absolute zero. So, you know, it was like 400 degrees below, uh, uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. So definitely not Kelvin. So most likely it's, uh, Celsius, but not really the point of the question. So we got what we needed from this. And so, um, there it is.